بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلوات الله وسلامه على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد المصطفى وعلى آله ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وما بعد إن شاء الله we'll look at سورة النبأ and I intend that we cover at least up to ayah 17 إن شاء الله سورة النبأ is the 78th chapter of Quran and it is the first surah in the last juz and this juz everyone knows what a juz is right if you don't know just uh, raise your hand or say something uh, briefly a juz is approximately 130th of the Quran so the Quran is distributed into different sections or portions I don't want to talk about all of them right now but one of that uh, physical distribution is uh, the what's called juz. Juz literally mean a part. Juz ushay is a part of something. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, approximately 30 equal parts so that a person reading one part per day would complete the entire Quran in a month, assuming that it's 30 days in the month. Um, so just this juz is called juz amma, comes from the first word in the juz, amma. And we'll talk about the meaning of amma. Uh, so Surah Al-Naba is the first surah in the 30th or last juz of the Quran. So our intention, inshallah, is uh, to go through this juz uh, ayah by ayah, hopefully word by word and understand it better. I'm hoping to do a little bit more grammar and, uh, and sarf, ilmu nahu sarf uh, in this class than I normally would. And the reason being is so that I hope that everybody memorize these surahs. If you have not already memorized Surah to Naba, go ahead and do so. If you wish to uh, read the surah to me, uh, you, we can do that. We can set up a separate class to do that, inshallah. Or you can just go ahead and read it and submit it to me. But don't submit in the tafsir class. Submit it uh, privately in your own uh, thing so we don't have everybody uh, overwhelmed with messages. And I would listen. And, um, and if there's anything to correct you on, I will do that, inshallah. So attempt to memorize at least up to the 17th verse for this week and then of course next week we will do more inshallah so we'll start with the surah suratun uh, an naba is suratun makkiyya and if someone is not familiar uh, with what that means i'll just remind you quickly uh, all the surahs in the quran 114 of them are either uh, suratun makkiyya or surah madaniyya what does it mean this is not a geographical uh, distribution or difference. Rather, it's a chronological. It's based on time, not on place. What that means is that anything that was sent down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he lived in Mecca before the hijrah is considered Makkiyya. Uh, and anything that came down to Rasulullah after the Hijrah uh, to Al Madinah is considered Madaniyya, even if it was revealed while he was in Mecca as uh, part of Surah Al Baqarah uh, and potentially other small surahs were. Uh, they are still considered Madaniyya, even though they were revealed while he was visiting uh, Mecca. So it's not a geographical. Uh, Difference or timeline, it's a timeline, a chronological difference. So, Surah Al Naba came down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was in Mecca. And actually, the dialogue or the discussion in the first few verses of this surah makes that evident or is evidence of that. Allah starts off by saying, after Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, and I will not do Tafsir of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim here, as we would do it at the starting of Surah Al-Fatiha, insha'Allah. 
Uh, that being said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is written at the starting of each surah in the Mushaf, except for Surah Tawbah, which is also called Surah Bara'a, the ninth chapter of Quran. And there is a reason for that that is not relevant right now. Uh, but it's written at the starting of Surah Naba, but it is not considered an ayah of Surah Naba. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is an ayah only of two surahs, and that is Surah Al Fatiha and, um, and Surah uh, An Naml. But it's not at the starting, it's not Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim at the starting of the surah that is an ayah. It's uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in an ayah within the surah when, uh, when Sulaiman alayhi salam wrote a letter. To the Queen of Saba, and within it he said, uh, it read, it says, Innahu bin Sulaiman wa innahu bismillahir rahmanir rahim. It is from Sulaiman alayhi salam, and it is with bismillahir rahmanir rahim. In the name of Allah, ar Rahman, ar Rahim, the merciful to the entire creation, especially merciful to the believers. The first ayah, Amma yatasa alun. Amma. Uh, literally means about what are they questioning each other and this translation here is my own translation um, I normally don't like to use the other translation because some of them don't flow and they use a language that people are not familiar with about what are they questioning each other so this is a very interesting uh, starting for a surah let's analyze the word amma. Now, I wrote it down here, uh, but I wrote down the analysis in a different uh, document, and I found it was too, too much uh, grammar, so I didn't uh, say, I didn't use that. Let me see. I guess I'll just reference it here for now. عما يتساءلون عما comes from the word عن and ما so عما is not one word عما is two words that have been uh, smushed or joined together and the way it's joined is a rule of Arabic language and Quran recitation so whenever you see <clears throat> an means about and ma means what. Whenever you see the two words written like this, so I'll go ahead and put that in Arabic. An, ma, you would combine them together. And it would be written like this. An and then ma. So this place here. I'm just showing you the process of what took place uh, to arrive at where where we are so it would be an ma but there is a rule that states that whenever you have a noon sakina followed by a meme we would merge the noon into the meme and it becomes am ma and normally we would keep the noon written there but in this case here the noon is eliminated it is not pronounced it is also not written but it's known it's there uh, an Arab speaker would know uh, that noon is there. You sense it from the word itself. And it becomes amma. But then <clears throat> there is another rule in Arabic. Uh, it is not sarf, it is not, uh, uh, it is not grammar. It is not ilm al-sarf nor ilm al-nahwi. It is what we call ilm al-imla, the way you write. Uh, or al-kitabah. Uh, our khat written is that whenever you have ma preceded by harfu jar so an is a preposition means about whenever the word ma is preceded 
by a preposition. Ma is in what we call halatul jar. It's in a state of jar. Uh, if you don't know what jar is, then you've missed uh, the first set of the grammar class. You need to follow up with that. This is not the place for that. But anyway, whenever the word ma is in a state of jar, we eliminate the alif. So that's the transposition that the word or apparent word amma, which are really two words, went through. It was originally an ma, and then the noon is merged into the meme, and the noon is eliminated, and then the alif is eliminated, and we end up with amma. It's very important for you to recognize that amma is not a verb. It, it, re it resembles a verb. The, wor the verb amma ya ummu, which is on the pattern of fa'ala, it's originally amma, amma, which means to be general. Uh, we say something is am, that the thing is general. And you find when you study usul al fiqh and fiqh itself, we would, we would say, this is something that is am, it's general, and this is something that is khas, that it is specific. That is not this word. This word amma is not amma ya'ummu min al umum, which means to be general, but it does resemble it. So now we know the, uh, the formation of the word amma. <clears throat> we look quickly also at the word yatasa'aluna. Uh, yatasa'aluna is on the pattern of tafa'ala. So for those of you who are doing Arabic grammar right now, you'll be able to follow this. This is the sixth pattern of the trilateral verb. Remember we say this pattern is formed by taking fa'ala, by taking fa'ala, adding a ta in front, and this ta is called a ta of bina. Um, it is not the ta of al mudari It's not the present tense ta. Rather, it's a structural part of the verb, and then adding an alif between the fa and the ayn, so it becomes tafa'ala, which means uh, he did. And we'll talk more about this pattern in a second. So yatasa'aluna come from tasa'ala, which is on the pattern of tafa'ala. And the way we make tasa'ala present tense is we put uh, the present tense letter in front, ya. Yeah. Yatasa'alu, and the ayn, which is the hamza here, will have a fatha. Um, and then the lamb will have a dhamma. It becomes yatasa'alu. And that is singular. To make it plural, we say yatasa'alu na. Yeah, sorry, yatasa'alu na. What did I do? Sorry. Yatasa'alu na. Oh boy. <coughs> Yatasa Aluna. So Yatasa Aluna is whom Yatasa Aluna. They uh, did such and such. So it comes from the verb Sa'ala on the pattern of Tafa'ala, which is Tasa'ala, present tense Yatasa Alu, plural Yatasa Aluna. At Tasa'ul, which is the verbal noun, we would be studying that um, not, not uh, tonight, my time, but next week, inshallah. Perhaps I'll touch it uh, briefly tonight if we finish the lesson I have prepared for that in the grammar class. Uh, the verbal noun from yatasa'alu, the action itself is called tasa'ul. When a word is on the pattern of tafa'ala, there are many potential meanings. One of them is, one of the most popular is an action that is performed by a group. An action that it is perform that is performed by a group. When the verb is on the pattern of fa'ala, which is the third pattern of the trilateral verb, is an action performed by two people, like jahada, uh, two people struggling against each other, qatala, two people fighting each other, darasa, two people studying, uh, kataba, two people corresponding or writing to each other. When it's a group of people, you add on the ta and it becomes tafa'ala, which means a group of people are doing the action. So sa'ala means to ask, tasa'ala means they ask each other. They ask each other. So coming back uh, to the verse now. Amma <clears throat> yatasa'aluna, about what? 
are they asking each other, questioning each other? So what happened is, uh, to give you the background of this ayah, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the, the message when he was 40 years old and approximately 13 years before Hijrah. And then he changed. And, and his life changed and his lifestyle changed and his mission changed and his interaction with people changed. And he started saying things to people that he never said before. And worse than that, when I say worse, relative to the perception of the people in Mecca, uh, he came up with uh, some innovative thoughts uh, that were uh, hot topics in society. Uh, they were, it's what we would say, the, the issues that are trending. Huh? Everybody is talking about it. So people would meet each other in the street, probably in their homes, at the marketplace and they say, are you hearing what he's saying? Are you hearing, he's claiming that he's a messenger. He is saying that he receives revelation from Allah. Now the Arabs knew Allah. The Arabs uh, knew Allah. Uh, in fact, to be a polytheist, a mushrik, you have to believe in Allah. Someone who does not believe in Allah is not mushrik. Mushrik means to share. So you actually give to Allah some of what rightfully belongs to Allah, but then you take some of what belongs to him and share it with other than him, the idols, the false gods uh, that they worship. So the Arabs, they knew Allah, but what they didn't know about Allah, uh, I'll tell you in a second, uh, these uh, things, issues they were talking about. And then also very difficult for them to understand and to accept is his claim that uh, after we die, we would be resurrected, uh, which is called al uh, Kufar Mecca had a very difficult time conceptualizing the potential and possibility that after we die and become dry bones, as they would say, uh, Is it that when we become bones and the bones become dust, that we will be created to a new creation. Uh, and the verses in, in this context are abundant in Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered them logically. And this is not the time, but if you really want to analyze a few very uh, interesting verses in this topic, then look at uh, uh, Surah to Yasin at the ending. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala analyzed that very logically and answered them. So let me summarize that. All the Surah al makkiyah address primarily four issues. These issues were the, the messengership of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Risalat al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he's the messenger of Allah. And there are many evidences and miracles to prove the that he's really a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is that the Quran is kalamullah, that Rasulullah was receiving wahi, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of angel uh, Jibreel, Gabriel alayhi salam. Uh, the third is that Allah is one, uh, what we call tawheedullah, the individuality, the singularity, the uniqueness of Allah in three, uh, in three aspects, which is Tawheed uh, al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed al-Asma'i wa-Sifat. And I'll summarize that very briefly in English, that the singularity and uniqueness of Allah in being the only creator, the only Rabb, he is the one who created the entire universe and other <laughs> uh, verses or universes that may exist. I believe in multiverses, but that's a different topic that it is, it is possible, there are verses in the Quran that imply that uh, just as like Allah created this universe that we exist in, uh, he could have created uh, what science referred to as parallel universes. And parallel doesn't mean in this, in, in my interpretation, to mean that everything is mirrored, rather they are done concurrently. Um, <clears throat> so that potential is there. That Allah created everything. He's the one who gave life to everything. He is the sustainer. He, uh, yeah, 
He is the only Rab. He is the one who gives life. He is the one that causes death. He is the one who will, uh, will resurrect us. He's the one who's going to judge us. He's the one who creates hell and heaven. He's the one who has the right to put who he wants there based on whatever criteria he determined. And of course, he taught us what those are. So that makes Allah Rabb, Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the entire uh, universe that we have. And if there are others, that too, and all the species and everything. That's called Tawheed al rububiyya the uniqueness, the individuality and singularity of Allah in the creation, in being Rabb. The second is Tawheed al uluhiyya the rights to worship, that Allah is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Uh, <clears throat> the people of Mecca mostly believed in Tawheed al rububiyya mostly. There are a few issues that they differ in, uh, or they had difference of opinions in. But generally, if you were to ask them, uh, who created them, they would say Allah. If you ask them who sent down the rain from the sky, they would say Allah. And these are verses in Quran, actually. Allah says, Allah. If you were to ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah. But what they didn't accept is the second form of Tawheed, which is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, or also called Tawheed al-Ubudiyya, that the rights to worship, that Allah is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. The people of Mecca didn't accept that. They would, uh, they would deny it. They would say, no, 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 no. We worship him, but we don't worship him directly. We worship our idols so the idols can take us nearer to Allah. And they say, Mana We do not worship these idols except that they should take us nearer to Allah. Because uh, we're, just, we're just normal human beings. We can't worship Allah directly. I mean, we can't even see him. But we can see these idols and they talk to him. They will, they will convey our messages and relay our messages to Allah. And of course, we know um, in, in Islam that is totally unacceptable. The relationship between uh, the servant and his creator is direct. There is no intermediate between us uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we always talk to Allah directly. Rabbi such and such, my Lord such and such, or Rabbuna such and such, Rabbana such and such. Or Allahumma directly, O oh Allah, we address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, we worship Allah directly, we do not worship him via Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or Jibreel alayhi salam or anyone or anything else. Uh, rather, we follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in worshiping Allah directly. He worshiped Allah directly and so do we. Um, so that's Tawheed al uluhiyya And then the third is al asmai wa Sifat the uh, uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some of his names and attributes, and I wouldn't detail that right now. But that being said, that was a, what, it was a difficult concept for the people of Mecca. And the fourth uh, up thing that uh, the Quran talks about is al-ba'su, uh, the resurrection, al-hashru, the gathering, and al-hisabu, the judgment, which are all uh, Referred to as Yawm al Qiyamah. So we have Yawm al Ba'thi, Yawm al Hisabi, uh, uh, sorry, Yawm al Hashri, and Yawm al Hisabi. Al Ba'thu, Al Hashru, Al Hisab, these three combined are called Al Qiyamah. Ba'th is when we are resurrected uh, from our graves, brought back to life, recreated. Hashr is when we're all brought together and gathered to stand up in that uh, place. Of judgment and uh, and the judgment itself is al hisab or ad deen. The, wo the word ad deen is used for that meaning in Quran in Surah Al Fatiha, Yawm ad deen. All of these three combined is what is referred to as Yawm al Qiyamah. The, the Arabs had a hard time accepting that. So, what you would find is these two, two issues primarily they would stand up and talk about. They would meet everywhere and they'll talk about it. Did you hear? That and I'm saying what they would say, Muhammad. I say, uh, in fact, I don't even like to call it as long as you don't address Rasulullah by his name directly. That's okay. Do you hear that he's claiming that Allah is one and he's the only one who should be worshipped and we can't worship the idols and he's insulting our idols and he's claiming that after we die that we would be brought back to life. Uh, if that's really true, let him bring back our four parents. Let us see our four parents. And in fact, they would go to him and challenge him uh, in these issues. 
That's what they were talking about. That's what the questioning or the tasa'ul was about. So after all of this is happening in society, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send them Surah Al-Naba. And this surah eloquently uh, refutes their claims and rejection of, uh, of the potential of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being one and us being uh, resurrected for Yawm Al-Qiyamah to be guided and judged on the Day of Judgment and then either punished by Allah or rewarded in Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be amongst those. So this is a, 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 an issue of faith. This is an issue of fundamental concepts in faith. And they are no small issue. It's not a small issue. It's actually really extremely important. Sometimes people think, you know, why, why talk about these issues of faith? Why don't we just talk about uh, fiqh? Why don't we talk about sirah? Why don't we talk about... Uh, you know, the Sharia and things like that, the verses that discuss all these details. Well, those are of no value if we're not convinced about these issues. A lot of times when you find people are struggling to live the deen, to implement the deen, is because of a weakness in Iman. Anytime you find a person is weak in his Islam, and by Islam I mean submitting to Allah, in obeying Allah, whether in, in, in critical basic things like salah or fasting or zakah or hajj if they have the ability to or Islamic behaviors in dress code and not drinking and not eating pork or staying away from uh, ad adultery and fornication. That person has a weakness in his faith. There's an underlying problem and he needs to really read the surah al makkiyah and become convinced. Surahs like Surah to naba <laughs> Aisha radiallahu anha said in a very beautiful hadith, and this hadith is hadith sahih narrated or collected by Imam al Bukhari, that once there was a man from Al Iraq that came and questioned her, and I don't want to talk about the details, but what amongst what she answered him is she said that had it been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had started off, no, she said the first of what came in the Quran was the Surah Al Makkiyah that addressed the Address the issues of Iman and for 13 years strengthen the Iman of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, his also. Uh, uh, and then the Surah al madaniyah came and taught us the deen. She said, had it been Allah had started off with those things by saying alcohol is forbidden, people would say we're not going to leave it off. Why? Because they don't have the foundation of faith to build that acceptance of, upon it. Or, or adultery or fornication is forbidden. And, the, and this was, by the way, rampant in Arab society. Uh, uh, that they would not have accepted it. They would say, we can't do that. Because they don't have the foundation of faith. So faith, Iman, and being convinced that there is a creator. And he's the only one who created everything. The only one who should be worshipped. He's unique. He's, he's an individual. He's single. He has no partners. Uh, that Muhammad Sallallahu is really the messenger of Allah. The Quran is kalamullah, the words of Allah, and uh, that Yawm Al Qiyamah is real. Especially this concept of belief in Yawm Al Qiyamah resurrection. Because re imagine if we believe in Allah, we believed in the Rasulullah, we believed in Quran, but the Quran didn't speak about resurrection. It just, you know, to live a good life, and that's the end. Then we would not have really been motivated the way we should be and the way we hopefully are in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when we recognize that there is a accountability and potentially retribution for every wrong that we have done, Yawm al-Qiyamah, and also compensation, because Allah motivates us by both scaring us of the consequences and also enticing us with the rewards, then we would not have been as motivated as we are. When a person realizes, I'm going to stand in front of Allah, and I have to account for everything that I believed in and everything I said and everything I did. Uh, it makes him uh, really change his ways, inshallah. So the people of Mecca, they would question each other. 
do you really believe this stuff? And this one would say, yeah, I think I believe some of it, but I have a little bit doubt. So they had varying opinions concerning this, and we'll examine that in the, in the third ayah. In ayah number two, Allah says, Allah asks the question, and then he answers it. <laughs> so in the first ayah, he says, about what are they questioning each other? And then he said, about the great news. So there, about the great news is not a sentence. So just to do a quick grammatical structure for, for those who know Arabic grammar, an is what we call harf jar. It's a preposition. It's originally sakin. It originally has a sukun there. Uh, but because this sukun on the noon meets the sukun on the, this noon here. This noon is really two noon. One with a sukun and the other with a fatha. The alif and the noon are not pronounced. These two are, are not read as if they are not there. Let's eliminate them quickly. So we have, and then if we split this noon, it would be like this. Uh, this is what this really is like. So really you have a noon with sukun meeting and noon with sukun. I wrote it like this for you to visualize it. Uh, you cannot pronounce that in Arabic. Uh, we, the Arabs don't allow what we call iltiqa isakinain, two sukuns meeting. So what we do, we would do tahrik al-awwal. We would put a haraka at the first. Most of the time, sometimes you do the second. Um, and we put a kasra here. And it become anin naba il And I'll write it back the way it should be written. So that noon here, this kasra and the noon, if you do i'rab, for those who do, of you who do i'rab, listen carefully. We do not say this noon is harakat al-i'rab. Uh, we call it harakat al-qira'a or al-imla. Uh, the way we would analyze it, we would say, an harf jarrin mabniyun ala sukuni mana'a min zuhurihi ishtigal al-mahalli bil kasrati bil takhallusi min iltiqa'i sakinayn. And that means exactly what I said in English before. And anyway, that's a preposition, a naba'i, is the, uh, the word uh, that comes after a preposition. Um, and al-azim is, a, is an adjective that describes the word al-naba. The word al-naba means news. About the news, al-azim, the magnificent, the great, the very important, huge, uh, consequential matter. In Arabic language, al-jarru al-majrur have no meaning on their own. It has to be connected to something before. And in this ayah, it is understood. This verb is understood. So it's as if Allah said, but of course he didn't repeat it, but it's understood. It's as if I were to ask you the question, about what are they questioning each other? And then you answer about the great news. What you mean, they are questioning each other about the great news. So it's as if you repeated this, here, uh, they are questioning each other about the great news. That's what this ayah means. It is understood before, but you don't, uh, you don't repeat it. Annaba. The word annaba uh, is a very interesting word, and it's used in the Quran for multiple meanings. But here, what it means is something that they have been informed of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I just said that alone. Allah uh, qualified that naba as being a naba al azim We say azuma shay, azuma is a verb. Something is azim uh, when it's, it's a consequential issue. It's a big, oh, sorry. When the thing is physically big, we say, this is big. So if I were to say to you, this is a huge boulder. Huh? Uh, that's what azim is used in, uh, literally to mean. So the word azim is normally used literally to mean something big. But when the issue is a huge issue, a consequential issue, an important issue, it is used. Uh, for the metaphorical usage of saying the issue is big. It's not physically big, but it is an important issue. It's a huge matter. 
then we use the word azim for that meaning. Uh, that is a borrowed uh, meaning. It's not the original meaning. Originally, it means something physically uh, big. Uh, but here, it doesn't mean it physically. It means uh, the issue is important. What is the issue that is important? All four of those issues. All four of those. And that's why <clears throat> some of the scholars uh, interpret the word, uh, or excuse me, uh, what we call adatu ta'arif, the alif and lam, uh, to mean all. To mean all. Like al-insan. Let me explain that. So if you were to look at Surah al asr everybody memorize it. Allah says, Innal insana la fi khus illa ladina amanu. So here we say al insan doesn't mean the person, it means every person. Wa al tufidu al kulla fil umumi fil jami'i wal ifradi kala alimi. So the word or the, the adatu ta'arif alif and lam means all. Sometimes, a lot of times, and in that ayah, al-insan means every insan, but there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said al-insan and didn't say al -nas. And we know it means all people because of the exception. Allah says, except those who have iman and do good deeds. And if it meant a single person, you cannot make an exception of a group from, a, from an individual. So it has to be that the thing you accept is more than the thing it's, a, it's an exception from. Hence, al-insan is clearly uh, a nas in surah al-insan. Uh, therefore, the way that's interpreted is in the Arabic language, alif and lam means all. They say the same thing here. All news that is azim, all information, all matters, all issues prevalent in society that are huge, and all four of those issues were. Most of the scholars, <coughs> interpret an naba to refer to the ba'ath. Huh? They refer to the ba'ath. Why? Because of the context of the verses. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 17, this is in the yawm al-fasli kana miqata, mentioned this ayah, which is the object behind the discussion. And we'll come to that ayah and I'll link them together why that's the case? Allah says, indeed, the day of uh, fossil, fossil literally means separation, but here it means judgment. By judging people, Allah separates us, Yawm al Qiyamah, uh, is an appointment, it's a fixed time. Uh, so, therefore, the discussion that is the point that Allah wants to get to. That's the object of all of this uh, clarification that preceded. Hence, what is meant by a naba is al ba'asu. That's the interpretation of most uh, of the mufassirin. Others, amongst them, uh, Ibn Ashur, uh, said no, it's global, it means all of them, but that is the one that Allah answered here. So they were really querying all of these issues. They didn't only talk about the resurrection and had concerns about that, but they also had concern about Rasulullah's claim, uh, I'm saying claim from their perspective, that he is a messenger, and also his claim that he received revelation and that the Quran is Kalamullah, and the claim that Allah is the only God and the only one who should be worshipped, uh, they also rejected that. So those were all, all four issues they were discussing, even though Allah only answered one of them here. Now it appears that he answered only one of them because technically he answered all. Why is that so? This is the Quran giving the answer. Hence, these answers which should be actually amazing from this verse here, verse number five, Alam Najalil Arba Mihadan, the verse number sixteen are just absolutely fabulous. What you may recur, refer to as scientific miracles uh, within the Quran uh, to show the power of Allah, so it answers Allah's ability and Allah's uniqueness. Uh, the fact that this is Quran, hence it answered the Quran is Kalam Allah because only Kalam Allah could have said this. And the fact that it came via uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it answered the messengership of Rasulullah So I say it appears that it only answers the ba'ath, the resurrection, but it really did answer all four of those. <clears throat> 
And then Allah qualified by saying huge matter, all four of those issues were huge, prevalent issues within society. Allah also qualifies uh, the issues by saying, Alladhi hum fihi mukhtalifun, which anaba alladhi. So alladhi hum fihi mukhtalifun, we call this uh, ismul mawsul and silatul mawsul. Uh, that is a description. So this entire sentence is a description for a naba or a second description, if you wish, because the first al azim is the first adjective, and this is a second uh, functional adjective. It, it functions as an adjective. That concerning which they differ. <clears throat> Whom they fihi concerning which. Mukhtalifun. Mukhtalifun is the plural from uh, the verb ikhtalafa. It's mulfa'il from the verb, the plural of mukhtalifun. Mukhtalifun, which means to differ from ikhtalafa. Ikhtalafa, which is the, sorry, I dropped the ta. The a pattern of the trilateral verb. So if you were to look at khalafa, add on, uh, uh, sorry, the ties, the ties after the kha. Ikhtalafa, if ta'ala, it's in the pattern of if ta'ala. Mukhtalif is what we call ismul fa'il, the name of the doer, and the plural is mukhtalifun. So that's the formation of the word mukhtalifun, and it means they differ. And how did they differ? Well, in every one of those four issues, they had different opinions. Some of them, uh, they, would, they would accept. Some of them accepted and then became Muslims. They accepted Islam. Uh, some of them uh, say, you know, I, I'm inclined to believe, but I have a little doubt. Uh, they would say, وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ uh, I'm inclined to believe it, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, some of them would completely uh, reject and some would consider. So yes, in all four of these issues, they had uh, varying uh, responses. <coughs> Excuse me. So to summarize these three verses, Allah is saying, here the people in Mecca are discussing these hot issues. Here this person, emerged from society he's known he's respected uh, he's trusted uh, he's truthful uh, and then he's making these these massive claims that that just uh, create conflict in society hot issues and people are just discussing them and talking about them if they were in, if they were newspapers those days they would be on front page headlines is what it is these are headline issues. If there was television, they would be on prime time. Huh? They would be on the radio, everybody discussing. Uh, it would be uh, trending in Twitter and, 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 in, and Instagram or whatever. That's what Allah intends. That's what you need to visualize when discussing these verses. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers now. Allah says, Kalla. <clears throat> The phrase kalla is used in the Quran a lot. It's used uh, for three meanings. In this context here, I don't want to talk about all three meanings. When we come across other, we'll talk, talk other meanings, we'll talk about them. Here in these verses, it is negating uh, what is implied before. So what is implied before? What is implied is not true. These issues are not true. We, we can't believe that. There is no way Allah would send a man as a messenger. If Allah wanted to send a messenger, he would send an angel. They used to say things like that. <clears throat> and what prevented people from believing when guidance came to them, except that they said, would Allah send a human be being as a messenger? And then Allah, uh, uh, would Allah send a man as a messenger? Why would he not send an angel uh, um, as a messenger? Uh, Allah is answering them and saying, 
no way, he really is the messenger of Allah. Or they would say, this is not kalam Allah. Allah is saying, no way. So when Allah says kalla, it's negating what they are, they are saying and establishing the contrary. Huh? So when they say he's not messenger, kalla means, no way, you're wrong. He really is the messenger of Allah. Or this is not kalam Allah. No way, it, he, it is really kalam Allah. Allah is one. Allah is not one. Uh, no way, Allah really is one. We are not going to be resurrected. Allah is saying, no, you're wrong. You are going to be resurrected. So that's what kalla means. Kalla is to negate their false claim and establish the truth or the contrary. And this is a sentence by itself uh, that is understood. <clears throat> so it's not written here. And then saya alamuna is a separate sentence. Hence, it is okay to stop at this point here. It's okay to put a walk there and separate the two in understanding. And many reciters, they read like this. They would say, So that's an acceptable recitation. Most people say, But it's much more eloquent when you stop. The meaning is much more uh, clearer in the mind when you say, So you establish this. Uh, <clears throat> Please, if, if as I'm talking, if you have uh, any difficulty understanding or need further clarification, go ahead and uh, say something. Saya alamun, ya alamun from Ali ma ya alamu. Ya alamun is plural. Hum ya alamuna. It's the present tense form of the verb. Sa uh, is not part of the verb. Sa means. Uh, in the future. Sa means will. It's the short form of the word saufa. Uh, saufa. So kalla, uh, excuse me, sa is an abbreviation of saufa. And of course, when you abbreviate it, you don't write the scene by itself, you join it to the verb. And sa is always placed in front of a present tense verb to make it future tense. Sayalamun. They will know. What does this I am mean? They shall find out or they will know. <clears throat> soon. You can translate it. They shall soon. If you were to put that in here, it wouldn't be a bad translation. They shall soon find out. And that what this is referring to here by most of the Mufassirin is a death. Death. All these uh, confusion that people have concerning these four concepts, the moment they die, it becomes clear the truth to them. That's why death is called al yaqeen in the verse where Allah says, Wa'abudu rabbaka hatta ya'tiyaka al yaqeen Worship your Lord until al yaqeen comes to you. What al yaqeen literally means conviction when you're convinced about something. Uh, what is meant by al yaqeen in this ayah is death. Death. Why is it called uh, al yaqeen? It's because at that point everybody is convinced. Even uh, Fir'aun, when he was about to die and he saw the angels, at that point he becomes convinced. He says, Allah says, Falamma adrakahu al gharaku. That uh, when he was about to drown, he said, I believe that there is no God uh, except the one that Bani Israel believe in, and I'm a, I'm a Muslim, I submit. That's because he was convinced at that point. He saw the angels of death. Yeah. There is ample evidence in Quran and Sunnah that when we die, we will see the angel of death and the angels who will be taking the soul from the angel of death that has been assigned to us. And the person would be convinced about everything. But at that point, it's too late for him to repent. His faith would not be accepted unless he previously had faith. 
That's what it meant by sayalamu. They shall soon find out. Then Allah says, Thumma. Thumma is what we call harf atfin. It's just like the wow, it's just like wa and also fa, but it's different. Wa is a conjunction that means uh, this and this with no specific order nor space or distance of time between the two or space of time between the two. That's wa. It's a conjunction in any order. For example, if I were to say to you, uh, I ate the, the apple and the banana. All I'm telling you is that I ate both of them. I'm not really telling you what order I ate them in. If I wanted to say that I ate them in a certain order, I would say either I ate the apple, then the, the banana. Of course, that also is obvious in English that there's an order. I ate the apple first and then uh, I ate the the banana. The fa in English, uh, in Arabic, also means soon after, immediate, actually, immediately after. I ate the apple, I was still hungry, I ate the banana right away. But then if I were to say to you, this actually means I ate the apple and later on I ate the banana. I didn't open it right away. I didn't peel it right away and ate it right away. I waited. There was some amount of time. How long? Allah knows how long. So Allah is saying, then later, then again, or later. No, wait. They shall find out. So the thumma is actually connected to sayah and amun. They will find out much later. So here the person will discover the truth, not only when he dies, but uh, there are two other times. <coughs> and, all, and both of those interpretations uh, are accepted by the scholars. Some say it's in the grave. Some say it's in the grave, and that is true, by the way. And that is in Quran. That is in uh, many places in Quran. Allah says in Quran, "Kalla lau ta'alamun ilm al-yaqin, la ta'rawun al-jahim, thumma la ta'rawunha ain al-yaqin." Allah says, and then if you knew for a certainty, ilm al-yaqin means with certain knowledge, being convinced that you will see hell. When do we see hell? We see hell in the grave. That's the first time. That's what it means. The ayah says, La al -jahim, that you will see al jahim that is hell. Uh, this is Surah At-Takathur, short surah. Then Allah says, Thumma la ayn al -yaqeen. Then you will surely, surely indeed see it uh, with the eyes of conviction, meaning you see it with your eyes, and that's Yawm al Qiyamah. So, the first ayah in La Tarawun al Jahim means uh, in the grave, and Thumma La Tarawun Ain al Yaqeen, and you'll see it with your eyes, your bare eyes, pretty much, uh, would be Yawm al Qiyamah. So, in this, in, in this ayah here, some of the scholars interpreted the second knowledge that people would have of these four things being the truth is in their grave. They will find out. We, are, we will find out. We will be convinced about it. The believer will see his place in hell when he is in the grave. By the way, that's not a mistake. <laughs> that's actually in the hadith. Long hadith narrated by Al-Bara ibn Azib, collected by Imam Ahmad, authenticated by Imam Al-Albani and other than him, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam detailed for us what transpires from the time uh, the person is about to die until uh, the time the angels come to him in the grave and question him and they leave. And he sees his place uh, in hell or heaven. So uh, what will happen to the believer is he would be shown his place in hell. What does that mean? The place he would have deserved had it not been he believed. So Allah would show him his place and the angels will say to him, if you didn't accept Islam, that's where you would have gone. That means his place in hell, the place that had belonged to him if he didn't believe. And then he would be shown his place in Jannah, which would make it much more appealing. Can you imagine how much more we would love Jannah after having seen what it would have been like had it not been that we had uh, believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other concepts of Iman and submitted.
<coughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our Iman, help us to submit. Amen, Ya Rabb. So, Sayya'alamun, uh, some of the scholars interpret it to mean uh, in the grave, and others say, no, Yawm al Qiyamah is what is this ayah means. And uh, there are others who say, no, both of them. And I, su I, I subscribe to both of them uh, because that's the style of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say it once and he means it multiple times. So Allah is saying, here they're questioning each other. Some of them are refusing to accept these truths. Uh, let's uh, say, for instance, the resurrection. And Allah is saying, no, you're going to find out. You're going to soon find out. You can reject it if you want. But as soon as you die, you're going to be convinced about it. But unfortunately, it will be too late. And then Allah is saying, and then later on again, you will surely find out. You're going to see it with your naked eyes. And it will be too late. Yeah. <clears throat> then Allah goes to ayah number one, two, three, four, five. Ayah number six. From ayah number six to ayah number 16, that would be 11 verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detailed why. Re he gave us reasons to consider, to deliberate upon, uh, so that we can be convinced that indeed this Quran is from Allah. Rasulullah is the messenger of Allah. Allah is indeed. Uh, the only creator, the only one who deserves to be worshipped, deserving of worship, and that Yawm al Qiyamah is possible and it's a reality. <clears throat> Let's look at these concepts one by one, and they are just actually absolutely fabulous. Allah says, after mentioning that they're discussing these issues, having a hard time accepting it, uh, Disputing amongst themselves, and Allah is telling them, You will find out. Allah is telling them, Think about it. Allah says, Did we not make the earth a cradle? Let's analyze this quickly. This Hamza is called Hamzatul Istifham. It's, used, it's placed in front of a sentence to convert it to a question. Lam is placed in front of the present tense verb, Naja'alu. It's originally Naja'alu. Huh? It without uh, without the lamb, it's naja'alu uh, from ja'ala ya ja'alu. So for those of you who are doing the grammar class, these words will make more sense now. And I'm highlighting it because I know quite a few of you are in that class. Uh, when you put lamb in front, it makes the verb majzum with sukun. Huh? It makes the verb maj majzum with sukun alam naja'al. But then we have the sukun on the lamb and the sukun on this lamb here meeting. So you have two sukuns meeting. So like we say in Arabic, we cannot have two sukuns meeting. So we put a lamb there just for the pronunciation. So the way we would do the arab of this, I'll just say it. If you follow great, if not, just uh, let it slide. We would say, fi'alun mudari'un majizum bilam. Lam an I'll explain that in English in a second. Majizumun wa alamatul jazmi as sukun wa ala akhirihi. There is a sukun here. Mana amin zuhurihi. You can't put two vowel. Mana amin zuhurihi. Ishtigal al mahalli bil kasrat in the khalas bil tukai sakinain. That this naja'al, the word naja'al has a sukun at the ending. It's built like that. You, you cannot change it. There is a sukun there. However, you cannot see the sukun because the place is occupied by a kasra. To eliminate the meeting of two sukuns. So the way we call we, with this this kasra here is not kasratul i'rab. It's not a kasra of grammatical analysis. Rather, it's a kasra arida. It's a, a circumstantial uh, kasra that is just there to eliminate the two sukuns meeting. There is really a, 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 a sukun there on the lamb. Lamb would take a present tense verb and convert it to negative past tense. That's an interesting function of lamb. So naja'alu mean we make. Lamb naja'al, we did not make. <laughs> so it converts the present tense to a negative past tense. Yeah, that's the function of lamb. So the hamza converts it to a question, lamb negative past tense. 
So originally this sentence, if we were to ignore this for now, just for a second, let's take this just to understand the structure. And we say, <clears throat> We make the earth mihadan a cradle. Naja'alul arda mihadan, we make the earth a cradle. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. Lam, we did not make the earth. Lam naja'alil arda mihadan. We did not make the earth a cradle. So we ignore uh, we ignore the Hamza, the question, and we say we did not make the earth a cradle. So that would be negating uh, the action. But then uh, when you put the a, it converts it to a question, which means to establish it. <laughs> this is an amazing structure of language, a utilization of word. So lam najalil abdomihadan would actually negate the action. It would mean we did not make the earth a cradle. Alam najalil abdomihadan. Did we not make the earth a cradle? Which is actually used to establish it. It's a rhetorical question. Allah does not want an answer. Allah just wants you to consider it and recognize it. So if I were to say to you, did I not uh, explain this to you before? I'm actually saying I explained it to you before. So Allah is establishing the fact that he made the earth me hadam. I'll explain two words here, the word naja'al. And I'll compare the word naja'al to khalaqa or ja'ala to khalaqa. Ja'ala means to make something something. So you have something and you change the, the nature, the form of the thing, the structure of the thing. You make it into something either physically or conceptually. I'll explain in a second. The difference when we come to it in the, the, in the verse, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا But for now, physically, Allah, created, Allah made the earth a cradle. This is much different. Had it been, he had said, Alamna khluqil arba mihadan would have been a huge scientific mistake, which is evidence that this Quran is from Allah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. The earth went through stages. This ayah here, this ayah, the utilization of the verb naja'al is implying that the earth went through stages in its creation, which of course we know is true based on what science has uh, discovered uh, the, the, the phases of the, the development uh, of the earth. The earth uh, took approximately 3.5 to 5 bi 4 billion years to be created and it went through stages and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the stages of the creation of the earth. Uh, Allah says, قُلْ أَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَكْفُرُونَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ وَتَجْعَلُونَ لَهُ أَنْدَادًا ذَلِكَ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ فِيهَا قُوَاتَهَا وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامِ سَوَاءَ لِلسَّائِلِينَ Allah talked about uh, two stages of the creation of the earth and then an additional two to make four st stages of the creation of the earth. And the word Allah used is يَوْم which means period. The word yawm is used in Quran to mean period. And it's used for four or five different meanings. And in this verse here, I don't want to talk about the details of the meanings of the word of yawm, yawm in Quran. In that ayah in Surah Fussilat, it means uh, an eon, a long period. Huh? It is also used in Quran to mean 50,000 years. Allah says, تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً uh, 50,000 years equivalent to the years that we count right now. But anyway, that being said, this utilization of the word Naja'al implies, in fact, it's clear, it, it connotes, it conveys the meaning that the earth went through phases in its creation. How is that so? This means that the earth was something other than Mihad, and then it became Mihad. So this ayah is saying the earth was not suitable for life. The earth was not suitable for life. And when the earth was formed, if you want to understand this more, I'll give you briefly here, but you can go and Google it and, and look at the, uh, how, uh, how the universe was created. In fact, there's a wonderful documentary, I think created in 2000, made in 2010, 
that is called How the Universe Works that talks about this. And by the way, that, that documentary is fascinating. Everything it says is like it jumped right out of Quran. But here Allah is saying that the earth was not suitable for life and then he made it suitable for life. Allah could have said, Alam naja'al al arda munasiban lil haya. Allah could have said, did we not make the earth suitable for life? But he didn't use that phrase. He used the phrase mihad and then he used here what we call an analogy. He compares the earth to a, a, a crib, if you wish, like the cradle of a baby. The cradle is very, it's not only suitable for life, but it's comfortable for life and it provides protection. It shows the vulnerability of human beings on earth. We are extremely vulnerable. Our tendency to life is, is very uh, uh, flimsy like the flimsiness of the, the web of the spider. We think, uh, you know, our connection to life is strong. It's not. <laughs> this life on earth is treacherous. It's, it's actually miraculous that we live uh, through the development in, in the wombs of our mothers. We take these things for granted. And the birth process and, and, and growing up as a baby, and coming out so perfectly shaped and suitable for life and, you know, with all these miraculous features and functions within us. And then, and, and so many things can destroy earth and, and make life impossible. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only made it possible, but made it comfortable. Not only made it comfortable, but protected us from all these treacherous <laughs> threats to life. We're being threatened constantly. The fact that we go to bed and wake up every morning is miraculous, honestly. It's a miracle. We just take it for granted. But when you consider the things that could make us die, right now that tiny invisible virus has brought uh, the earth, the planet, to its, to its knees. Huh? It just shows how vulnerable we are. And by the way, one of the lessons we can learn from this coronavirus is our dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much he's in control. We're not in control. We may be powerful, or, or excuse me, we may consider ourselves powerful that we can do this and we can do that and we can build buildings and build highways and build airplanes and rockets and do this and do that. But you know what? We can't protect ourselves from a tiny little virus. Subhanallah. And there's so many other things, but Allah made this earth suitable for life made it comfortable for life and give us protection from everything. If from a physics perspective, I were to discuss this ayah, we would never stop. <laughs> we would just never, ever stop. Even from biology, and I'm sure, Sister Halem, you would be very versed in that. And I'm quite sure others amongst you would be very versed in so many other functions on earth. Had it not been they were there, life just was not possible on this planet. There was a time when this planet was just a boiling ball of lava. Nothing can survive on it. And then it cooled down and then certain life was formed in it. And there was an evolution of life on earth. Please understand my statement. My statement is not that I believe in evolution as Darwin preaches in it. But I believe in evolution in the evolution of the creation of the universe and the creation of the earth and certain life forms on earth. There are a few life forms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted their evolution and others he established the potential. The, the life forms that Allah refuted their evolution is the creation of man, human beings, the creation of jinns, the creation of angels, and the creation of, listen carefully, camels, cows, goats, and sheep. And maybe sometime I'll talk about the details of that. But these life forms did not evolve, and the others potentially did. Potentially, all the life forms evolved on earth, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Anyway, that being said, is that there are so many things I'll just share with you. I mean, I could pick from a long list. Let me just pick one uh, <clears throat> force of gravity. So the gravitational force, the gravitational force, uh, there's something we call uh, the gravitational constant. The, uh, scientists represented or mathematicians represented by capital G. 
It's called the gravitational constant. So the formula is this, and this was, uh, I wouldn't say discovered, was formulated by Isaac Newton in something that he called the universal, the, the law of universal gravitation, the law of universal gravitation. And the law states that every body, body here means object, not person, every body uh, attracts every other body by a force that is proportional to the product of their masses and indirectly proportional to the square of their distances apart multiplied by the gravitational constant. And what that means is that the bigger things are, the, more, the, the greater the attraction between the two of them. And the nearer they are, the greater the attraction. The smaller they are, the weaker the attraction. The further apart, the weaker the attraction. Without gravitation, life would be impossible. Without gravitation being precisely, uh, I think it's 9.4 meters per second, uh, it would not, life would not be possible on Earth. Life would not be possible on Earth. Why is that so? SubhanAllah. The gravitation between the planets and the sun that keeps us revolving around the sun approximately once every year. <clears throat> and by the way, approximately is correct. It's not precisely. <laughs> There's an adjustment that has to be made for the Gregorian year. That's why the lunar year is much more precise than the Gre Gregorian year. The Gregorian year has to make adjustments. And I think it was in 1482, somewhere there, that they had to, um, they had to uh, subtract 10 days from the Gregorian calendar to adjust the position of the Earth with respect to the sun. But that being said, um, without that gravitational force being precisely what it is, the Earth would either be too far to or too near to the sun, and it would be dragged into the sun, and life would not be possible, or it would float away from the sun, and life would not be possible. So the gravitational force that attracts the Earth to the sun is precise. Let me give you another uh, point about gravitation. <clears throat> uh, the, the gravitation of the moon to the Earth. So the moon uh, revolves around the Earth. The moon is what we call a satellite of the Earth. And because of the, the, the gravitation being precisely what it is, had it been it was greater, the moon would, cr would crash into the earth or crash into the earth and crash it. And, uh, or if it was weaker, it would float away from the earth. Also, check this out. The tides, do you know the tides are caused by the gravitation of the moon on the earth? So the earth is attracting the moon by keeping it in its path. And the moon is attracting the earth. And... Uh, and at, and at the same time, it's pulling the water towards it. So if you can, if you can visualize uh, the earth as it is, the, the earth is surrounded by water, and <clears throat> the water is being pulled towards the earth and the side that's facing the earth. Hence, you have a high tide on that side, and the opposite side of the earth, you have a high tide, and the two opposing sides, excuse me, <clears throat> you have low tides. That's why you have high tides, and low tides twice every day. And by the way, as I'm right here, right outside my window, I can actually look right now. It's low <laughs> tide and it's gonna get high tide by 10 o'clock a.m. And I've been observing it every day. And that comes from the gravitational pull of the moon and the earth. How is it possible that life, because of that life is possible on earth, suitable? Very simple, it, get, it creates flow of the water. The tides create flow within the water. Had it been that the oceans were stagnant, then life would not have been possible. The water would have been contaminated. Of course, there are other functions that, uh, that contribute to this too, but the, but the gravitational pull of the moon and the earth is a great uh, contribution towards the tides and the flow of water, movement of water. Also, had it been that the moon was nearer to the earth, the tides would have been too high. It would have flooded the earth every day. And then life would not be possible. SubhanAllah. So everything is precisely balanced. So when Allah says, did we not make the earth nihad and a cradle? This ayah means tens of thousands only. Allah knows how many functions in creation all combined simultaneously, precisely measured. And everything with him in precise measures for life to be uh, possible and sustainable on this planet. So Allah is telling the people in Mecca, did you not consider the fact 
that this earth is like a cradle, that life is possible, that that is proof and evidence that there is a creator. <laughs> Did you not consider that? And simultaneously, let's take the fourth concept and that the one who did this can recreate you. That's what the ayah really means. That's what it really means. Allah is saying, ponder upon the fact that life is possible on this planet and you will conclude that there is a creator and that you will be resurrected. And by the way, the fact that the Quran is mentioning this, that this is kalamullah. And the fact that Rasulullah came with it, he's really the messenger of Allah. This phrase here could not have been coined by Rasulullah. It's too precise. In the utilization of the structure of the language, and by using the verb naj'al, and by using the analogy of a cradle, is proof that Rasulullah didn't say this. Even scientists would have said, did we not make the earth suitable for life? And they would have used the word make. Did we not create the earth suitable for life? Which would have been a huge mistake. Let me, uh, let me clarify that. Had it been Allah had used the word khalaqa like he did in azwaj. Here, it would have been a mistake. Because it would have negated the phases of the creation of the earth. And it would have implied that earth was initially originally created day one suitable for life simple let me just say this to you right now i'm going to show you this had it been allah had said Alam it would have been evident that this quran is not from allah it was fabricated that rasulullah wrote it and lied about it it would have been it would have meant that and it would have been proof that the Qur'an is not from Allah. That's why Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Do they not ponder upon Qur'an? وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had it been that it was from other than Allah, you would have found within it many conflicts and contradictions. Huh? And it would have conflicted with reality. But now, you can never ever find science disproving the Quran or the Quran contradicting itself. That is not the case. So the very utilization of the word Naj'al and not Nakhluk is proof that this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah continues, Wal Jibala Awtada. Wow. Absolutely fascinating. Wal Jibala, Jibal is the plural of Jabal means mountain and the mountains autadan as pegs the word autad is the plural of watid or watad both are used in the arabic language which means a peg al watad is if you were to, uh, the arabs use it a lot uh, the arabs understood this ayah <laughs> so they didn't have houses as much the bedouins especially they would have tents they travel around they take their houses with them. And when you, when you set up the tent, you would stick a peg in the earth, you would hammer it into the ground, and you would connect the rope of the tent to it to, keep it to, to stabilize it, to keep it from uh, being blown away by the wind. And Allah characterized the mountains as pegs. But let me do the grammatical analysis for this so you can understand the ayah. And the mountains, pegs. This here is, we say, al waw harf al wal jibal ma'atufun ala al ard And the word al jibal is, is, is joined onto the earth. Therefore, it inherits the verb or the structure of the sentence. What this means, alam naja, wa alam naja al jibala awtada. That's what it means. Oh, I, I, I moved it. I fixed that. And did we not also make the mountains pegs or as pegs, like pegs? So this means, did we not make the earth a cradle, sort of life, and everything else? Uh, 
And did we not make the mountain peg? Wow. <clears throat> this is fascinating. This also implies that the mountains were not originally created on the earth. In the original creation of the earth, there was no mountains. And by the way, science proves that. It's not possible. <laughs> the earth was a boiling ball of lava. There was no mountains. There just was not mountains. The mountains were established later on. And science uh, think the mountains came out from the earth but the Quran implies that the mountains were thrown into the earth the way you would throw arrows into an object. Allah says, وَأَلْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَيْسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِكُمْ And Allah is the one who threw, threw into the earth رَوَيْسِيَ stabilizers. رَسَخَ means to stabilize. The mountains are called stabilizers. So that the earth does not float away with you or expand uh, with you. What is this talking about? By the way, I read an amazing article last time. Scientific article had nothing to do with Islam. was not written by a Muslim. But it talks about the function of the mountains in stabilizing the, the, the crust of the earth onto what's called the tectonic plate. So if you were to look at the layers of the physical earth, the earth itself, there are many layers, and there is a there is a integrate integral relationship between them, and the role of the mountains in stabilizing the 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 continents in their in their current positions. Subhanallah. I ask you, how did Rasulullah know this? It would have appeared to a layman. You know, the earth was, if he claims the earth was created, it was created and the mountains were created day one. Not that they were placed there later on. And not that they are like pegs. And the, and the uh, proverbial uh, one third of the iceberg is applicable to mountains also. That when we see an iceberg, there are two thirds of the iceberg below the water and one third above the water. It's the same for the mountains. So the mountains function like pegs that stabilize the crust of the earth uh, to the tectonic plates so that they don't move. And uh, these, the, 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 the crust of the earth is actually floating on water and on lava. <laughs> they show you how treacherous life is, if you think about it. The middle of the earth is boiling, boiling lava. And it pours out, we see it, in our, uh, uh, excuse me, volcanoes all the time. SubhanAllah, it's just amazing. And did we not make the mountains as pegs to stabilize the earth? When you consider that, you will recognize that the one who did this deserves to be worshipped and is capable of resurrecting us. And the Quran that is speaking about this is really kalam Allah because it could not have been said by human beings and that the Rasulullah really is a messenger of Allah. And created you as pairs. <laughs> wow. Amazing. The utilization of the word khalaqa in the midst of ja'ala. Ja'ala, ja'ala. This verb, there's, the, the verb ja'ala is in this here uh, based on the conjunction. Ja'ala, 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 ja'ala. Bana, ah, the utilization of the word bana, I'll come to that, and then ja'ala. So you have ja'ala, one, two, three, four, five, six, and in the midst of that, you have khalaqa and bana. That by itself is miraculous. So let's take the word khalaqa. Khalaqa means to create something and make it in its original form the way it is. By, by the way, which is a refut, refuting the evolution of the human being. So Allah is saying, he made us like this. Had it been, Allah had said, had it been the Quran had said, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا would have been proof this is not Kalam Allah. <laughs> this is not from Allah. Why? It would have mean we were made in a certain way first and then later on made into pairs. But khalaqa, khalaqanakum azwajan. 
Allah made you like that from day one. We didn't evolve. And by the way, the Quran refuting the evolution of the human species is abundant. And unfortunately, many people who are not versed in, in the meanings and the subtleties of the Arabic language and Quran and claim to be scientists, they believe in the evolution of the human being. And that is not true. That is just not true at all. And when scientists look for, for uh, proof for the evolution of human beings as they claim to do and they're looking on earth, you're looking in the wrong place. Man was not created on earth. He was created in a different place. Man was created on Jannah. Adam alayhi salam and his wife Hawa, Eve, were created in Jannah and then brought to the earth, brought down to the earth, implying, actually not implying, making it very clear that it's a different place. It's other than the earth. So if you want to look for evolution of the human being, you need to go to Jannah and look there. You can't be looking here. That's why we came from Jannah and we're attempting to go back to Jannah. Sometimes I joke around, people say to me, where are you originally from? I say, I'm originally from Jannah. <laughs> and I'm trying to find my way back. My great, very great grandfather and grandmother were from Jannah and they moved to earth. But anyway, Khalaqa uh, is explicit in meaning man was originally created in the way they are as a pair or as peers. Not later on made like that. So we did not evolve. In fact, the, the, the function of reproduction by the utilization of the pairs is proof of man uh, not evolving. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. If man evolves, then it must mean, by man I mean human beings, it must mean that before man evolved into a fully functional man and a fully functional woman, with a fully functional reproductive system that they had to uh, procreate in a different manner. Let me explain that again. Very simple. Until you have a woman with a functional uterus and everything else, all the organs and the systems to reproduce, she cannot reproduce. And until you have a, a man with a fully functional reproduction system and organs and all of that, so he can reproduce, they cannot come together and reproduce. So they had to reproduce by a different manner before that. So we're saying some blind force in, in nature guided man independently to develop, independent of the female. And then sometime billions of years later, they would come together to make each other. The fact that we reproduce as a pair means we were created like that and did not evolve. So I'll ask the scientists who say that we evolved. How did we reproduce before we were fully functioning, functional? Independently, men and women separately, and then came together to re reproduce each other. By the way, the word azwaj is plural of zawj. The word azwaj is the plural of zawj, and zawj means pair, pair of anything. But it's used as a pair for spouses. So the word zawj in this context here means uh, spouse. It can mean both male and female. We say the man is the zawj, is the pair of his wife. And we say the other way around also. Al-mar'atu zawju ba'aliha that the woman is the pair of her husband. So the man is a pair for the wife and the wife is a pair for the man. So zawj is used both ways. We say the woman is zawj and the man is zawj. Together we are a pair. We need each other. Men and women need each other. SubhanAllah. In more ways than we can ever, ever imagine. You know, these, these uh, movements, uh, gender, inequality and gaps and claims and struggles and we 
always hear the comedians laughing about women this and women that and and women say men this and men that we don't mean. that is such a foolish ignorant thing allah is the creator allah created us like this we are different in certain manners but we each have our function and we're just as important just as important and have the same potential and that's why an ayah in quran that is extremely eloquent in establishing this is the ayah in surah al-ahzab where allah says in al muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati wal qanitina wal qanitati ila akhir al ayah that muslim men and muslim women believing men and believing women obedient men and obedient women truthful men and truthful women men who give charity women who give charity uh, humble men and humble women men who fast and women who fast men who remember allah a lot and women who remember allah a lot men who protect their chastity women who protect their modesty and chastity allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a huge reward we are equal we are equal in that term in other ways we are not equal so i don't believe in the equality of the gender in the meaning that we are the same no we're different <laughs> we're different women and men are different wal aysa dhakaru kal untha and the male is not like the female the male is not like the female and by the way interestingly some of the scholars in that verse say this implies that the woman is better than the man <laughs> you say how is that the case <laughs> if i were to say to you if you say you have apples and i say in guyana we have mangoes and you say oh uh, uh, no if i say we have mangoes because i like mangoes more than apples if i say we have mangoes you say ah oh, we have something equal in america we have apples i say to you oh the apples is not like the mangoes the apples are not like the mangoes i imply that the mangoes are better than the apples <laughs> so when allah says wa laysa zakaru kal untha implies that the female is superior to the male it's interesting allah says in quran wallahu ja'ala lakum min anfusikum wallahu ja'ala lakum min anfusikum azwaja wa ja'ala lakum min azwajikum banina wa hafada allah created you from yourselves wives here as well as wives and from your wives he created children and grandchildren go ahead say it. <coughs> hello someone wanted to say something yeah i guess i'm muted um that being said and allah created you as peers the fact that allah created us as peers is miraculous it's something we take for granted these there are so many miracles in nature that because they are so abundant so prevalent and we see them all the time we we ignore the magnitude of the miracle every time a woman becomes pregnant every time a baby is born is a miracle it is a miracle can you imagine if some alien <laughs> arrived on earth right and he doesn't know how how uh, we procreate come from some planet imagine came out of nowhere right and he arrived on earth and found men and women he said mm, you all are different where you come from say well well we take one of this one and we take one of that one and they, you know such and such and then uh, and then uh, Uh, the seed will uh, grow inside the woman with uh, merge with an egg and it and it fertilizes it and then uh, a fetus is formed and it clings to the uterus and then uh, after 9 months it develops and after 9 months a baby pops out of her a baby is born he would say you're a comedian you're a joker that don't make sense it's ridiculous yes if we didn't see this if we did not witness the 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 procreation process the process of birth in front of our own eyes and somebody told us and we didn't see it we wouldn't believe in it we would reject it <laughs> similarly imagine the fruits imagine somebody came to earth and saw all these fruits you know at the fruit market every kind of fruits on earth beautiful tasting and said man these things are amazing where you get them from i take a mango i open it up and say see the seed here I take the seed and stick it in the ground. You know, after a period of time, it will germinate. A plant will grow out. It becomes a tree, and then it will bear thousands of the same fruit. The person will say, "Man, you you really a comedian. You know, you should do stand up comedy. This is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense." But because we witness it, 
we, we trivialize the magnitude of the miracle. It's miraculous. So Allah is saying, and we created you as pair. He's telling the people, listen, ponder upon the fact that you're pair. You created in pair and the way you procreate, ponder upon it, and you would recognize that there is a creator, and that that creator and that creator is unique, and he's an individual, and he's unique, and he's he's singular, and he's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. And by the way, if he can do this, he can recreate you. And the fact that the Quran is speaking about this means it's from Allah. And the fact that Rasulullah came with it, he's the messenger of Allah. And we made your sleep subata. Uh, do you all need to take a break from uh, Maghrib? I think I got a message. Yes. Uh, so let's go ahead and pause here and we'll uh, uh, resume in uh, 10 minutes, inshallah. So we left off in the ayah وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ And we made نَوْمَكُمْ Your sleep سُبَاتًا سُبَاتًا mean a break I'll explain that in a second more Something I did not uh, talk about and it's because it was so obvious uh, it didn't cross my mind uh, we Allah keeps saying we Najal we made Khalaqna we created Ja'alna we made and that continue Ja'alna 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 Banayna and Zalna Linukhrija so that we can so if Allah referred to himself in all of these verses as we we call it Noon ul Azama uh, the noon of majesty, uh, the personal plural pronoun uh, used for singular as uh, a sign of azamatullah or an implication or indication, an indication, a connotation of the greatness and majesty of Allah. That is a normal utilization of the noon in the Arabic language. It does not by any means imply that these functions are performed uh, by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا And we made your sleep. نَوْمَكُمْ Your sleep. سُبَاتًا سَبَتَ مِنْ قَطَعًا سَبَتَ عَنِ الشَّيْءَ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَنْهُ What that means is that سَبَتَ uh, means to take a break to cut off, to stop, to terminate, to end. Actually, not to terminate, that would be a wrong translation, because it implies that the thing will continue later. So, so something is happening, and during the course of the thing happening, there is a period of time when it does not, that is called sapt, a sapt wine is shay. So sabata mean qata'a, uh, so what it means is that Allah is saying we make your sleep as a break. Break from what? What would be spoke, spoken about in this ayah. So in the, in the 24 hour period of a day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a period of time where we do now, which is sleep. Uh, and, uh, and he called that sleep a break, a break from activity. I'm going to comment on that. In a second, but let me make uh, another observation first before I comment on that. Some people say this ayah is proof that the Quran is not Kalamullah. Okay, <laughs> so I want to refute that or I want to answer that. And the reason they say that is because in the Arabic language they use the word subat to mean sleep. So they say the Quran is saying we make your sleep a sleep. And that, that is illogical. It's uh, redundant. It makes no sense. How can you make my sleep a sleep? It's already sleep. So therefore, the Quran is wrong. The answer to them is that you don't understand the Arabic language. You use the word subat to mean sleep. But subat literally means a break. So Allah is saying here, he made the sleep a break from something else. So subatan. Min al-amal, 
من الكدح من مشقات اليوم that Allah made the sleep a break from your activities from your actions from your hardships from your struggles from your strivings that is what it means so subat is not now subat is a break from something so the sleep is a break from something Allah is saying I made your sleep a break so Allah wanted us to take a break and he could take a break and made us just sit down or wonder or I don't know stare at the stars but he gave us the sleep as a break and that is extremely meaningful oh the way we are designed the way the human being is designed is we need sleep sleep is not a luxury sleep is not uh, superfluous it's a it's an integral important part of the functionality of the human being for us to take that break for every every aspect of our of our being our existence physically we need a break huh? so during uh, our activities uh, in working out in lifting things in doing things our muscles actually tear our muscles tear and when the muscles repair is when we go to sleep well even other times when you're not doing actions your muscles repair but especially during sleep our minds our minds are active the mind need a rest we need that rest otherwise we lose our mind if a person were to go uh, continuously for three days uh, without sleep, you start, you start hallucinating. By the fourth day, you'd be seeing things that don't exist. You need that sleep. We need that break from our activities. Allah designed us like that. Why did Allah design us like that? Why did he not make us like angels? Why did Allah not make us where we don't need to sleep, we don't need to eat? Allah knows. This is, this is the wisdom of Allah. He could have done it like that. And inshallah, Yawm al-Qiyamah will be like that. In Jannah, we will not sleep, by the way. That is in a hadith. I want you to know that when I read that hadith, that in Jannah, there is no sleep. It was a little bit disappointing for me because I was thinking after you go to Jannah, you get a nice, good rest, you know. But we don't need it. Right now, having a sleep is appealing to us because we need it and we enjoy it as human beings. When you get a good night's sleep, or a good rest, you wake up feeling real good. Well, we already feel like that. In, uh, we feel better than that in Jannah. So we don't need that rest. But Allah created us like that uh, for whatever divine wisdom, perhaps, perhaps, for us to recognize our, uh, our weakness and our dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't want to make us perfect in this life. Inshallah, yawm al-qiyamah, we will be in Jannah, bi uh, as perfect as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends for human being to be. But on this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us that way, where we are weak, where we need uh, sleep. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا And human beings were created uh, weak. Uh, part of that weakness is that we tie a part of uh, physically and mentally and emotionally and, uh, and psychologically. And we need a break from all of the uh, functions of life that that cause those hardships and difficulties and tiredness and stress and allah gave it give it us give us that in the form of sleep so what this ayah is saying and we made your sleep as a break from your activity for you to rejuvenate recoup uh, re-energize and then come back uh, renewed the next day inshallah assuming that we had a good night uh, rest and sleep and assuming we sleep during the night but that being said Allah is saying here in this ayah uh, consider this don't you see the one who made your sleep as a break from your activity so that you can recoup and rejuvenate and re-energize re yourselves uh, is the creator and that he him doing that makes him capable of resurrecting you and the fact that the Quran uh, speaks about this, shows that the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah who came with it is really the messenger of Allah. Do you not see that? That's what the, that's what the implications are. Uh, it appears Allah knows best within these verses. وَجَعَلْنَا Layla libasan. This phrase here is actually fascinating. I'll show you. Allah says, and we made the night a clothing. A Layla libasan. Excuse me. Allah created the night. Allah created night and day 
and he alternated them. Uh, the Quran spoke about night and day in the most eloquent fashion. I want to highlight one of them, one of those things here, because uh, interpreting Livas would be built upon that, is that the night merges into day, into the day, and the day merges into the night. Allah utilizes the phrase "yulijul laila fil nahari wa yulijul nahara fil lail." Awlaja mean to merge. Awlaja uh, merge. One enters the other. Walaja. <laughs> Uh, mean to enter something. You will lead you to make something enter. So Allah is the one who takes the night and he makes it merge into the day and he takes the day and make it merge into the night. If a person was to go out of earth, so if you can picture yourself just you know, in a rocket, whatever it is, going out of earth and you're observing earth from outside and you were to look at the phenomenon of night and day, you would see it appears on the morning side as if the, the day is merging into the night. And if you look at the evening side, Maghrib, you would see as if the night is actually merging into the day. It looks like they're merging into each other. Allah also use, characterize it. Allah says, uh, uh, And the night, we peel the day from it. Allah says he peels the night away from the day. So if you were to look at the earth, it will look as if the night is being peeled away slowly uh, from, from the day. So those characterizations. Allah says, and we made the night a clothing. Clothing from what? Amazing, amazing, amazing. This earth is being... Well, okay, first of all, what is clothing? What are clothing used for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this phrase here as an analogy in many places in the Quran. But physically, clothing are used for, uh, for number one, uh, covering our shame. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put clothing. Ya bani adama qad anzalna alaykum libas. And you wear is awatikum, cover your shame. Wa rishan an adornment. So clothing is where the primary purpose for clothing is to cover our shame. Huh? So as human beings, we have what we consider private, Allah made us like that, and clothing, the primary function is to cover our shape, but also as an adornment. Uh, people use it for ranks, especially hats, and the kind of suits that people wear. Um, but also another function is clothing is a protection. Clothing protects us. Clothing, we wear clothing, and you can see this when it's winter, you put on more clothing, you put heavy coats on, you put it on the thermals to keep in the heat. Uh, and when it's uh, cool, we use clothing to cover us from the sh shade of the sun. Right now, I go around a lot during the day here. I'm in Thailand. And uh, during the day, it's very hot. <laughs> so I would wear a hat always. Always walk around uh, with a hat in Thailand. Otherwise, I, I just feel like my, my brain is boiling. <laughs> uh, so clothing is there to protect us from, uh, from the elements, from the, the sun, from the cold. Uh, and from other things, the dust particles. Hey, I enjoy sometimes when now that whenever you go out here, you have to wear the mask. I like wearing it because it protects uh, me from breathing in the dust in the street and so on. Some places people will be cooking in the street and the smoke is there. So clothing function as a protection also. The night is a clothing. So it's as if, if you can picture the earth, imagine... Uh, Allah had designed the earth in a way uh, where it's either flat like the flat earthers claim <laughs> and the sun was always, it was always, the side we live on was always facing, imagine it was like a coin and the side that we live on was always facing uh, the sun, then we would have perpetual uh, sun and it would be destructive. There would be no protection against the sun and the rays and the gamma rays and the radiation and all the bombardment from that. So we needed protection. Allah is saying he made the night like that. The night is clothing. And one of the functionality of the night is to protect us. It cools off the earth. At that time, the, the, the earth is able to relieve itself from the stress of the day. That is there for functions. It's, it's, it's there for a functionality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the day, which he'll explain in the next ayah, as a, a means for us to seek our livelihood. But then you need the night as that protection. Allah says, consider the fact 
that Allah created the night as a clothing to clothe you. That darkness is a, is a clothing. Uh, and it has many other implications, by the way. Some of the Mufassirin says, a time uh, when the night conceals uh, things, so you're able to, let's say, uh, carry out uh, certain actions within the night that you would not be able to do within the day. Like, for example, invade the enemy. <laughs> This was the Arabs' uh, strategy. They would actually do their invasion at night and early morning. They would surprise them. And by the way, this is in Surah Al-Adiyat. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَ فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ قَدْحَ فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ صُبْحَ فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ صُبْحَ And the one that invade and attack the enemies in the early morning. Uh, anyway, the night is a cover. So you can perform those military strategies, for instance. They use it for that kind of interpretation. وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشَ And we, need, we made the day as a means of livelihood. The word ma'ash comes from the verb عَاشَ يَعِيشُ which means to live. And ma'ash is the thing that make life possible, that make you live. And what it's talking about here primarily is our sustenance, but potentially more than that. So the day is the, the time in which uh, we are able to seek our livelihood. It's also... Uh, potentially what implies here is when the rays of the sun hit the plants and the plants are able to grow to provide us with, uh, with sustenance. Uh, most, if not all of our food, well, not all, yeah, most of our food come from the plants, uh, uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talked about later in this ayah, uh, And by the way, when you see this flow of the verses, maybe I'll comment on that at the ending inshallah to connect them to show you the logical uh, layout of these uh, 11 verses and we made the day as a means for your livelihood to strive by the way the implication in this is that you have to strive for your livelihood the human being should not sit down and pray that livelihood come to him you get up and you work ya ayyuhal insanu innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadihan famulaqihi this Quran encourages us to strive and work hard. The word kadah, al-kadahu, means hard work. Allah says, O man, innaka kadihun ila rabbi. You have to work hard to return to the Lord. Kadah and famulayqi. Hard work so that you can meet him. Uh, one of the great scholars says, one sadfa in the laziz al aishi fin nasabi. Work hard because the, 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 the pleasures of life is in hard work. Yes, when a person works hard and strive for his livelihood, if he earns that livelihood, he, in, he enjoys it much more than one uh, uh, who just lays back and receives it whatever by inheritance or just smooch off his parents or someone else. Uh, we should be people who are always active, doing something, we're productive. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Rasulullah, perhaps that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَضْصَبْ That when... Uh, when you have space, when you have completed a task, uh, when you're finished with something, fansab, work hard, do something else. Always recreate yourself. Always uh, set another goal. So that's the way we're supposed to be in life is that we set goals and we strive for things. And the moment you achieve that, don't become lazy. Set another goal uh, and just improve and become better. Whether it's goal in knowledge, which of course we always have to start with knowledge because you cannot intend or do anything that you don't know. Uh, so we strive for knowledge and then we make our intentions to achieve things and, then, and, 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 and memorize Quran and study the deen and the ibadat and work hard and, 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 and knowledge of the dunya and, and achieving things and, and, and earning and all of that stuff and physical strength and protecting our bodies and working out and eating healthy and so many goals and having children and raising them Islamically and educating them and doing all that kind of stuff. We always should be setting uh, these goals for ourselves. That's part of the ma'ash Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and he made the day uh, for that. Uh, I think uh, I would stop here and we will continue on wabanayna fawqakum sab'an shidadan. Inshallah, the next time. Is that okay or you want to continue? I'm cool. I'm full of energy, but I know it's been a long discussion. I think it's about time we stop. What sayest thou? Hello? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> yeah, should, so we'll stop here, Inshallah. Any questions? Okay. Any questions on the verses?
that we were uh, discussing so far? It's just the way you explain things. It's so exciting and amazing and to see things in a different um, perspective. Who is so this? The eye opening the way. This is Selwa. Oh, okay, Sister Selwa. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, yeah well, it's, I'm so pleased that Alhamdulillah, I'm able to, to listen. Alhamdulillah. Um, I will go ahead and um, uh, uh, upload it to YouTube and share the link. Share it with others if, if, if you don't mind. Jazakumullah khairan, subhanakallah. Inshallah. Sir, 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 question, question, question. Go ahead. Have a question. So you, you talked, we talked, you talked about evolution and we fairly discussed on that topic. It may not exactly be related to the surah and the tafsir uh, that you shared with us thus far, but what is, does the Quran speak about? So, uh, so your question, but any concerning uh, the claim of the evolution of human beings, by, uh, of course, the Darwinians and other evolutionist scientists and uh, many uh, who claim to be Muslims, but I don't want to reject their deen, who are Muslims and they claim evolution from Quran. Uh, that is false. That is false. Let me explain why. Within the Quran is evidence, and I'll show you some of this inshallah. I want to make this brief. Maybe sometime we can talk about this in detail, but briefly, that we are not the first life form on earth. That human beings are not the first form of what we may refer to as civilized life of, an, of a species similar to human being on earth. And that is implied in Quran when Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَالِيفَةً قَالُوا أَتَجَعَلُوا فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ uh, and when your Lord said to the angels, I will create an earth khalifa, uh, uh, a vicegerent, someone to be in charge that comes after, and I'll explain the word khalifa in a second. Uh, they said, uh, the angels objected, or it appears that they objected. They said, would you create within it one who sheds blood? Uh, one who caused mischief within it and shed blood while we celebrate your praises and we glorify you. He said, I know what you do not know. So within this IS, two uh, pieces of evidences that shows that there were other creations before mankind. The fact that Allah referred to us as Khalifa. Khalifa does not mean to be in charge. That's an imprecise translation. Khalifa does not mean to be in charge. Khalifa means to come after. Huh? <laughs> Allah says, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ the others came after them. Allah is talking about the angels. And they lost salah. Allah is talking about the followers of the previous messengers and that we don't be like them. So they were taught to do salah. They lost salah. They give up on salah. That's why we're the only one who remain who actually do the salah the way the Abiyah were taught. But I don't want to detail that. The point is, Khalafa means they came after, which implied, actually it's explicit. There was another civilization before us. And from the comment or the objection, or the apparent objection, I want to be humble here uh, in defense of the angels, is, is just an observation. Perhaps they're saying, are they going, it's as if they say, are they going to be like those who were here before? When they said, would you create within it those who will cause mischief? It implies, in fact, it's nearly explicit that there was a life form on earth that created mischief. And because of that, and they shed blood, and because of that, Allah destroyed them. So the angels are saying, okay, okay, you're going to create Khalifa. Is it going to be just like the ones that were here before? Are they going to come after, and it's just going to be the same nonsense again, and you're going to destroy them? How do we know that Allah destroyed them? Very simple. Allah made that threat to us. Allah says, Allah says, uh, in Surah to nisa Allah says, that if Allah wishes, I'm trying to find the verse in my head. Uh, see if you remember the ayahs, uh, 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 that Allah says, if Allah wishes, he can uh, destroy you and create after you uh, a new creation. And that is not difficult for Allah. So Allah threatens us that if he wants, Allah is telling human beings, listen, uh, if Allah wants, he can destroy you and replace you with a new creation. And that is easy for him to do it appears that Allah actually did 
exercise this threat on a previous civilization that may be similar to human beings. So when we go and we dig up and we excavate and we go and do whatever we do and we find uh, uh, these traces of civilization that existed before, the DNA, of course, is going to appear to be the same. Allah is not going to recreate his creation just to create another species of new, on the life. They'd be very similar. In fact, we share what? About 65 to 70% of the DNA with a banana. Can anybody back me up here? Ahram, I know you are much into the, uh, the sciences. Tell me what you have about this. But anyway, that being said, you will find similarities that don't mean that we evolve from them. Huh? So when they, whether it's the Neanderthals or whatever, they dig up and they claim that we evolved from them because we see them here, that is only under the assumption that there is not a creation and that we evolved. So evolution is proof of itself. So you have to actually believe in evolution and reject creation for you to believe in evolution. But if the scientist is actually honest and if he's open-minded because that's the way science ought to be and say, uh, perhaps because I know I'm much more ignorant that I'm knowledgeable and, and the knowledge of the creator is part of my ignorance, then bearing in mind the potential of the existence of a creator, he could have created other creations and what I'm observing is another creation but not the creation of man. And man did not evolve from this creation, but was created by the same creator. Hence, they have common traits uh, and similarities, but it's a different creation. So the Quran anyway, is very specific, very clear that Adam السلام, and Eve were created in heaven. And then uh, because of the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they were brought down to earth. Part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Allah knows best. Uh, did that answer anything for you? <laughs> yeah. My question is slight. My my question was directed in a slightly different manner. So there, Let's hear. Let's there's hear. two parts. There's two parts. Okay. One one was that uh, there's a hadith that I heard from from a certain somebody um, that uh, Adam alayhi salam was tall, tall to the point where they said he was about eighty ninety feet tall. Mm, okay. Said those hadith. That's one and two was the the what I had, the initial intention of the question was to was to find out the evolution past the first first creation. So there were giants at some point, and then based on the evolution of mankind, I, what what the scientists are kind of projecting is we're going to uh, and and uh, Sister Ahlam, you said was a biologist. Maybe she can refute this. She can say that it isn't so. That we're inching towards dwarfism. That so is possible. That, so does, yeah, so in that form, but that's for evolution. That. That's that, that, so that's a different thing. That's adaptability. That's adapting to, to, to changes. So if you were to say theoretically, when Adam السلام, and Hawa were placed on earth, they were the only one who were breathing the air, drinking the water. Everything was organic. Everything was healthy. And then they, 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 they just live a completely 100% healthy life. Everything they ate, everything they did, there was no stress in life. But as time progressed, man was bombarded with, with so much uh, hardships and difficulties and stress and contamination that our, our physical nature slowly, slowly degraded. And that we observe all the time. Yes, so over a period of time, that is factual. That is actually established uh, clearly in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and very authentic in that Yawm al Qiyamah, when we recreated, we would be recreated in the original form of Adam السلام, and we would be Situna Dira and we would be 60 Dira, arm's length. <laughs> and by the way, the Hanafiya says Situna Dira is 90 feet, and the Shafi'i has said it's 120 feet, and at that point I said I'm Shafi'i. <laughs> anyway, uh, so. <laughs> that, yeah, so that uh, in Jannah we will be restored to the original form. So that's potentially true, but that is completely different take than one who claims that we were just a single uh, one cell organism, an amoeba, and then we evolved, and then we were in the oceans, and then we crawled out, and then we crawled on land, and then we wake our feet, and then we evolved, and then human came later on. It's a completely different take than that take on. Uh, Darwinism or the evolution according to Darwin. Uh, Sheikh, is there is there a possibility that the the civilization? That is, one second, that's created. not only possible. I really believe that did happen. Yeah. Uh, is there is there a possibility that um, the the civilization that was created before 
before humans was the jinn kind. And I, I'm yeah, almost not, certain that I read that in the, we are not, uh, Okay, that is true. So jinns were created before human beings, but jinn is a parallel creation with human beings, even though they preceded us in time, they still continue to exist. So jinns exist today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a creation that we replaced. We did not replace jinn. We're in parallel existence with jinn. So that there is true. Jinns were created before us, but we didn't replace them. Are you following me? Jinns continue to exist. This is this is clear in the Quran. And when we send a group of jinns listening to you read in the Quran, so it's obvious the jinns existed in the time of the Prophet and they continue to exist. There's nothing that claims the jinn ceased to exist upon the arrival of man or before the arrival of man. So that's completely different. Yes. Allah knows best. Uh, that being said, is that the, the Muslim is always open-minded and he goes wherever the evidences and logics uh, point him to. And there is nothing within evidences or logics that establishes the evolution of the human being or refutes the creation of man. Inshallah. You said, there was, was there another point you wanted to make, Ane, or who wanted to speak? No, we're just saying thank you very much. This was extremely interesting. I'm not going to comment too much on evolution, but about what Anai was saying, there is another thing that we see in the text is that like some people before us were living much longer than us today. Mm -hmm. um, and about the evolution after you know creation, we know that we do evolve for sure scientifically because there is a lot of spontaneous mutations that happen, you know, like embryonically and and when it's a mutation that is kind of a gain of function, it does stay, you know, like it's something that is um, like beneficial for humans. So it's like a mutation that would survive, you know. Um, and just to comment about what you were saying, one of the arguments you were like um, telling us about when you were like um, saying that evolution is something you don't believe in. I think that um, you were saying that basically um, like how come we don't, um, like we, we cannot like evolution is not true because otherwise like how can we like reproduce and like you know but the thing is that like reproduction reproduction organs can be uh, perfectly fine and you would have like human evolution in other genes and like that brain evolution or these kind of things so I thought that argument was not super convincing it's just a comment you know in general I'm not like you know saying that you know like what i think about the evolution or whatever i'm just saying that yeah anyway, i don't know I hear you, you i hear you yeah but so the i agree with you so that we have two things here the first one is i agree with you that man adapts man adapt and we change based on circumstances uh and yes our lifespan is reduced our our sizes have been reduced but that is not evidence that man evolved. That is still possible that Allah created Adam in its perfect form, put him on earth completely as a human being, and then we adapted and changed. So the yeah, two of them, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, and that's what I believe. And as for me saying that, uh, that, the reproductive system had to be perfect before we reproduce. That is actually factual. Our reproduction system could not have, uh, we, what I meant is until the reproductive system was perfect, we had to reproduce some other way. How would it have been? That, so I'm just presenting a logical argument. Explain to me someone how we evolve as independent agendas and then uh, by some form, and then later on, a uh, hundred million years later, come together to recreate each other. That's just a logical argument. And the fact that the reproductive system had to be perfect before we reproduce is factual. Because if you have a woman with an incomplete reproductive system, right, she can't have a baby. And the same for a man. Um, anyway, uh, Allah knows best. And when I say I believe in evolution, I made it very clear that I believe in evolution of the universe, of the earth, and potentially certain life forms, but not angels, jinns, human beings, 
and these four uh, pairs of animals that I mentioned. And that's because there's evidence in the Quran that these were created the way they were created. And yeah, that was very clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Allah knows best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, guide us to the truth in these matters. Regardless of, uh, let me just say, let me say right now, regardless of this uh, philosophical and it's potentially an ideological uh, perception of reality, what, what remains is that Allah uh, created us, Allah did use that phrase, and that we need to worship him. Uh, and that he's going to recreate, resurrect the Yom of Qiyam and justice is going to be hell and heaven. And the deen is still intact. So whatever the person's belief is, is concerning evolution, uh, when it comes to implementing the deen, there is no practical ramification to it. So it's not like a person say, I believe in evolution, therefore that means that Allah doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, that's, that's true. That's an atheist, yeah. yeah. Anyway. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك